A DM I played with insisted we relayed all of our actions in great detail as if we were making a wish with a genie that just had a grudge against all living creatures. Like, I'm not even kidding. I go through the door. Well, that command would have your character faceplant the door since you're not a ghost, so you would have to say, I reach out my right hand and grab the door handle, turn it to the right and push the door all the way open. I enter the room with my feet, starting with the left foot. Okay, you push the door open and then face plan again. It seems the door doesn't open in that direction. I am a hero of the Sword Coast and savior of Baldur's Gate. I now journey into the hells to salvage the heart of a friend trapped in the realms below. I go knowing that I may face my death, but I go also knowing- Every single situation. Horrible, terrible behavior from the Dungeon Master. Though I will say, between Vox Machina and Baldur's Gate 3, I feel like struggling to open up doors and go through them is a D&D staple at this point. Maybe the DM's onto something. I've been struggling with my prep time recently. I think I just need a small distraction to get me through the hours it takes to prep my game. If only there was something I could do when I take a break from managing my D&D notes. Thankfully, I found Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is a 4X MMO game set in the ever-expanding universe of Star Trek. Recruit legendary characters to crew iconic ships from over 50 years of Star Trek stories and send them on missions of exploration to expand your territory. All of this is available on both both desktop and mobile with a Scopely account, you can play at home and on the go, seamlessly connecting your game. During the month of December, we're getting Star Trek The Next Generation content, something that has got me personally excited, with new fleet commanders, new features like wave defense, giving new ways for players to socially interact, new missions, and even more. New content updates like this are a constant in Star Trek Fleet Command. And if you want to join right now, you can use promo code WARPSPEED. All you need to do is download Star Trek Fleet Command using my link in the description. Once in game, go to your player profile, open up settings, choose general, and scroll down to the very end to sign up for your Scopely account. Then go to the official website, StarTrekFleetCommand.com, click the store icon in the header, and log in with the Scopely account on the webpage. Once you're there, access promo codes on the left-hand side of the menu, enter in the promo code, and boom, you've got your rewards. If you guys are interested, then you can head down into the description down below, or use the pinned comment, to download Star Trek Fleet Command yourself. Remember, use code WARPSPEED for tons of free content. Thank you so much, Star Trek Fleet Command, for sponsoring today's video. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. Hey there, Crispy. I've got a story here for you. Maybe not the most intense horror story ever, but it's had a lasting effect on how I both play and GM. I was part of a group of people that have been playing D&D 5th Edition together for a couple of years. We mostly did modules, but our Dungeon Master was really good at taking a module and rewriting it to suit what we all preferred. For example, reskinning some NPCs in Curse of Strahd as a creepy traveling carnival. I still use that one in my own games. Anyway, we were looking for a new module to try out. We heard Descent to Avernus had a great premise, so we gave it a shot. But something was kind of off about our dungeon master this time around. First, the DM became very insistent about lore compliance when we'd never really had an issue with that before. As in, we were all making our characters, there were certain races that we weren't allowed to pick. The problem character was our warlock who wanted to play a race that apparently doesn't technically exist in Forgotten Realms lore, like Eladrin or Changeling. I'm not a lore expert. The player was really disappointed but eventually settled on their second choice. Then, as we started playing the actual game, a lot of things that might have been at one point overruled started to become way more strict. Namely, how exactly to get rid of poisoning. Turns out, our party had a bad composition for being given poison drinks by noblemen, a situation we never thought we'd get into when hearing Descent into Avernus' premise. There were also a lot of arguments when the Dungeon Master wouldn't let us buy dynamite because they didn't want firearms mechanics. That's Unearthed Arcana. We were still vetoed when we pointed out the dynamite is in the DMG. Huh. So, I checked, and it is in the DMG under Adventuring Options in the Explosive section on page 267. So, yeah, it's in the DMG, but rules is written, it is an optional feature that DM may not include. But also, counter argument, boomstick equal fun. As for firearms being unearthed arcana, this was a couple years ago, so maybe it was, but I just don't remember. 
what ended up being the nail in the coffin for us was just that Descent into Avernus has some really weird early game basic. <laughs> yeah! There were like five different times we were convinced this would be the moment that everything hit the fan and we were all gonna get dragged into hell, only for us to be just okay. And eventually, we had to take a road trip to Candlekeep and volunteer to go in. I'm sure that's not a problem for most parties, but I felt like the start was just way too long before it got to the stuff we were actually here for. The first mission, once you get to Avernus, was also disappointing, meeting a really cool NPC who then basically disappeared entirely from the story afterwards. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard of these problems before in Descent to Avernus. Did the DM just make up new ones? I mean, at least they have an entrepreneurial spirit. So the party just wasn't having fun, which meant tensions rose even higher. Eventually, the DM revealed that they were interested in pay DMing and wanted to get a feel for more serious gaming. At first, we thought this meant they were going to start charging us, and that started a huge fight. But in retrospect, I think they were just trying to be more mechanics and lore strict in order to pr practice, I guess? But it meant that a lot of rule of cool, just friends having fun aspects we loved about that group completely deteriorated. Eventually, I said I wasn't having fun anymore. Other players started agreeing, and that was basically the end of the campaign and the end of our group. I still talk to the DM sometimes, but it's awkward, and they never want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. I guess if there's a lesson to be learned here, just be honest about your intent. And if you change your mind about how you want to run your game, just sit the party down and discuss it. That particular group was not interested in rules lowering. We really just were looking to have some fun together. I don't know, did we as players do something wrong? Nope. Look, if the DM wants to change their style, that's awesome. That's all fine and dandy. But at the same time, like you said, you do need to clarify that. And also, seriously, for the love of God, if you want to get into paid DMing, don't just spring that in your home game party with no extra context, because proposing that a free group of your friends pay you for Dungeons & Dragons, not gonna go over well. Also, yeah, Descent to Avernus has famous early game issues, but since it's famous, a lot of DMs know how to avoid those sorts of things. Also, also, being a good paid DM isn't about being strict to rules as written and lore as written. It's about being good at the game and making sure that your customers are having fun. And let me tell you, if you can't do that with your good friends, you're not going to be able to do it with random people. I don't know if this counts as an actual D&D horror story, but it rubbed me the wrong way, and despite several months having passed, I'm still upset about what happened. So I've been playing D&D actively for four years now, though I have been playing other RPGs before, including some Vampire the Masquerade and Cock <laughs> games. But actual D&D at a table with a dice, I've only had a few years under my belt, and always as a player. Now my spouse is an amazing dungeon master, but unfortunately, this has landed them in the position of Forever DM. They were starting to burn out after leading our current weekly campaign, almost two and a half years and still going. I wanted to give them a break, so I decided I would try my hand at DMing and DM a one-shot, maybe even making it a two-shot. I homebrewed the whole thing, probably did a lot more work than what was necessary for a one-shot, but I had this harebrained idea that I really liked and I wanted to execute. I'm very self-conscious as a writer and a world builder, so despite wanting to give my dungeon master a break, I did ask for assistance a few times. I also asked another player, also a semi-forever DM and TTRPG genius, for guidance. I think I came up with something decent. I put a lot of work into it, creating props and... Re re realia? What is that word? It's a word. I think it's the wrong word, but it is a word. Anyway, yeah, that stuff for my players to interact with. A zillion NPCs, just in case, etc. I have a friend who was also interested in Dungeons & Dragons and had never tried it. She's very shy and has social anxiety, so joining a group where she doesn't know the Dungeon Master made her uncomfortable. So we decided to take the leap together. Me to gain confidence at DMing and she to finally play the game with some support. The other three players at the table were my spouse, a forever DM, TTRPG genius, a semi-forever DM, and another friend we'll call Edgy, who DM'd the first D&D campaign I played in. Now, because this was a one-shot and my first experience behind the screen, I asked for people to keep their backstories simple. My new player friend got assistance from that TTRPG genius for her character creation and got something really nice too. A small blurb, a couple of paragraphs tops to explain why the characters were in the setting. That was all that I asked for. I can't say much more about the setting because if I do, I'd be telling on myself, sorry. In any case, my players respected this request of mine. The characters were all great and really cute with short and sweet backstory blurbs, edgy included. I was happy with things. 
Then came the character art fiasco. This was just for the Roll20 tokens. We sourced pictures off the internet since this was for a private game and we just wanted something to represent our characters. Edgy picked an anime... I can't say that, but I also don't know what that is. Should I look it up? A few moments later. That was a really bad idea. He had an anime F-boy image, which I would've been fine with had the character not been a half-naked thirst trap for no reason, wearing only a towel. I joked I hoped they'd be wearing more clothes in my setting, seeing as all the characters were underage, but they said no. They said if they had to wear a shirt, they would cut it up and make it Stalin and threadbare. I thought this was a bit <laughs> cringe and tried to hint that the shirt joke had gone a bit far, but they just kept going. They added crop tops, tastefully see-through shirts, and other stuff to the list of things they would make their character wear in a setting that was absolutely not appropriate. I asked that they change their character art in hopes that the character would have clothes on, and Edgy got upset, saying that I didn't like their concept, but it was the jokes and the thirst trap crap for an underage character that was making me uncomfortable, not the base concept. They changed the character art at the end for the image and we were both happy with it. I told myself this was fine, we moved on. Now that the shirt joke was over with, this was done and over and shouldn't affect my one shot. I put a lot of work into the one shot, creating... Okay, they're using the word again, so I feel like this is just something I don't know about. Google, hey Google, are you lying to me? I was creating Relia and props for my players, writing speeches for NPCs that were extremely detailed just in case. I was really nervous when the big day came, and so was new player friend. So we jump into things and Edgy immediately decides they're metaphorically not going to play ball with the other kids. I set up a lot of things and Edgy just did everything they could to go against the grain. They never used the words, it's what my character would do, but it was borderline. When I asked why they did some of this stuff, the response was, well, my character is being forced to be here. They don't really want to be here in the first place. I mean, fair, I guess. I set myself up for that with this setting, but the game kept derailing for the purposes of Edgy's character. They stole an item and tried to sell it to some NPCs behind the back of the other characters. They tried to make shady deals. They didn't want to befriend anyone in the party, etc. I was getting a little upset by how things were turning out because it felt like herding cats, though I suppose that's what DMing is. Looking at new player friend especially made me sad because she was so anxious with the roleplay and very uncomfortable around Edgy's really confrontational character. And she seemed on the verge of tears or just running away from my table. <sighs> oh my god, my first Dungeons and Dragons adventure. I cannot wait to experience this world of roleplay and camaraderie. Oh, hey, uh, hello there. I'm, I'm a member of your party. Stop talking, what class are you? Oh, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wizard, I... Okay, okay, what's your entire backstory in detail? Um, uh, I, I, it, it's, it's pretty short. This, this is my, my first time, so, um, um, my, my parents... That's not enough detail. What are you hiding? I, I mean, I'm not really hiding anything, but if I was, I mean, shouldn't we, like, reveal that over time? You could be a danger to me, a danger to this party. Do I need to kill you? Whoa, oh my god, okay, I, I feel like we're, we're getting a little bit extreme. Sorry, but this is just what my character would do. I'm naturally confrontational, suspicious, and just hate everybody. I think this is a great character for you to roleplay in your first ever- <sighs> Seriously, again? I do not understand why it is so hard for me to get new people in the Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, honestly, some people just don't have the mental capacity for it, I guess. <laughs> the game ended with a short combat that I had balanced extremely poorly, and so while there was much in this one shot unresolved due to all the derailing, it ended lamely on a to be continued, but we don't know what that would be note. Edgy just really upset me by going against the grain in every way, mainly because I would put an insane amount of work into this one shot and was hoping to actually make it a single session thing. I think I was upset because Edgy knew full well that this was my first time DMing, and they did nothing to be helpful except argue with me. I felt exhausted by the end of the session, but worst of all was the expression on new player's face. She lost all interest in Dungeons & Dragons and didn't want to play again. She said roleplay with someone as confrontational as Edgy had made her extremely anxious because she didn't know how to react and her character had just wanted to be friendly when Edgy pushed her away. She doesn't want to play again even with an experienced DM because of this. That broke my heart. While I am fully aware that I made mistakes as the Dungeon Master and it started with that shirt comment during character creation, I can't help but feel like the experience was a mediocre one at best. I don't want to blame Edgy, but the fact is, I never want to be a dungeon master again, and I'm finding it difficult to not resent Edgy a little, though I'm fairly certain it's my fault things went south because I was the dungeon master. New player is never playing again, I take full responsibility for that one. 
And the reason I never want to DM again is that it was exhausting. It was exhausting to rain in edgy all the time during the game that I lost all my spoons almost instantly. I'm not cut out for DMing, clearly, and I admire DMs who are constantly having to wrangle players into their scenarios and manage to do so without being upset. I can see why my spouse got burnt out. I haven't been able to talk to Edgy about it all, so it's been festering in the back of my mind for months now. Edgy is very sensitive, and I haven't been able to talk to them about how they made me feel during the session. I know if I talk to them, they'll get upset and start playing the, well, I guess my concept just wasn't good enough game. This kind of behavior is a bit of a pattern with Edgy. They'll get upset at the slightest criticism and blow up. And don't get me wrong, Edgy's a good friend. And I absolutely adore them at a game. <laughs> I guess I'll take your word for it. But they have a habit of seeing commentary as adversity. So now I'm left with this lame, not actually a horror story story that I feel awful about, but can't figure out how to resolve it. I'm also sad that my setting will never be played properly. It was a really cool concept, and others who hear about it all express great interest, but I can't do it again. <laughs> Why not? Did Edgy suck the knowledge out of your brain? <laughs> I'm very sorry this was long, rambling, and incomprehensible whining. I just had to get it out since I can't talk to Edgy about it. Thanks for reading. Sorry for taking up your time. You don't need to say sorry, man. You didn't do anything wrong. And come on, this is my job. So it is a DM's responsibility to lead the charge in resolving problems at the table. But number one, you are a brand new game master dealing with a player who is really not doing themselves or you any favors. Look, I get it. A DM needs to give their players a reason to follow the story. But the players also need to buy in too. It's a two-way street. People who pretend like it's the DM's total responsibility to force their players to go along with the plot when they have players who just aren't doing it. I'm sorry, man, but if the players are just refusing to participate, that's on the players, not the dungeon master. The example I always give, if you're playing Cursor Strahd and you refuse to go to Barovia where the module takes place, you're not being creative, you're not being interesting, you're just disrupting the game and making it unfun for everyone else. If you're gonna play the game, you need to play the game. Honestly, this type of player is the type of player that infuriates me the most because they always find someone else to blame, when really, it's them that are making the experience unfun for themselves. On top of that though, Edgy is also ruining the experience for a new player and for you as a new dungeon master. Again, the DM has some responsibility for managing the situation, but you're new. And honestly, a lot of this, in fact, the vast majority falls on Edgy's head. This is about a player I knew during my college days who I'll call Mike. He never did anything egregious like cheating or trying to <clears throat> explicitly assault other characters, thank God. But it was a slow buildup of whining and low-grade douchiness. The first time I met Mike was at a level 20 one-shot, which was a bunch of strong monsters one after another, finishing with the Tarrasque. This was the first meetup of a college D&D club. Mike introduced his character as a multi-class ranger warlock Aarakocra. He used his character pretty much whenever he could, changing only the level for each campaign. All dialogue is paraphrased. Mike spends the first couple turns dashing upwards until he is 599 feet in the air. Then he starts making attack rolls. Mike, I use my bow to attack the dragon. Other player. Hey, why are you rolling your disadvantage? Didn't you take the sharpshooter feet? I need to maximize my constitution and take the tough feet. You're going to make every attack a disadvantage, right? It's worth it to be at maximum range. For some reason, he insists on being able to spam both Eldritch Blast and Arrows at range, focusing on two things, plus his insistence on maximizing hit points and disadvantage on every roll. He did very little damage. Yes, I have pierced the beast's armor class. The dungeon master was such a fool. After wasting most of my turns going up far into the sky, this ground-based creature stands no chance against me. I will now destroy it from above, while also abandoning my teammates to absorb the damage. Which I could have taken anyway, because I have the tough feet. But it doesn't matter. I'm completely hey. invincible. Oi! Hello! Huh? You gonna roll for damage? Oh, right. Yeah. I'll roll for damage. You better get ready. This monster is so screwed with my build. That's eight points of damage. Uh, okay. So is it like almost dead, or...?
No! Now, it sounds like I'm just crapping on another player's build, but he would also alternate between boasting about his character and insisting he's being targeted if the dungeon master directed any attacks at him. So, anyway, we beat the Tarask, damage is tallied up, Mike did the least damage in the party by far, but didn't take a single hit, probably because the DM just didn't care to chase him. Your characters are useless. Ugh, I could have soloed that. Your character did the least damage. Damn, this is taking me back to when I played video games with, like, other people. Ugh, the only reason we wiped is because you guys aren't doing enough damage. The reason we wiped is because you weren't focusing on mechanics, and your DPS sucks! Good to know these guys also exist in the tabletop world. According to Mike, damage ratio to damage taken, that's what really matters. Cut to a bit later, I'm doing a full campaign in the Underdark. Mike is one of the other players. He switches Eric Cocker to a Dampier, probably for free Spider Clam and... Spider Clam? <laughs> Spider Climb. And guess what? He spent the entire time on the ceiling at maximum range planking away at the enemies. He gets hit by a single crossbow bolt while the paladin is bleeding on the floor. Oh my god, you're targeting me! A drow sneaks up behind him using its own spider climb. You're bullying me! At the dungeon master. Eventually, the players are trying to cross the giant chasm filled with spider webs. We're fighting a beholder variant and it uses its paralysis ray on Mike. He fails to save and falls into some spider webs. Mike starts whining about it for, like, a minute. When he realizes the dungeon master won't take it back, he gets up, knocks over the DM screen, storms out. This is the last I saw him for about a year. Later, I'm DMing my own campaign set in Cholt. Cholt, right? Some of the other players really like Mike, for some reason, and ask me to include him. He insists on his usual build, of course. There's a bunch of minor incidents, like him not being able to see through a jungle canopy 600 feet up at night. The players reach the mid-boss checkpoint. It's a demon snake man who's fire immune and a sorcerer. The players have had a skirmish with him before and think his most powerful spell is lightning bolt. He has about 100 foot range on his spell and his movement is 30 feet. I'll fly 140 feet away and attack. I notice you put your character over the lava pit in the center of the map. Too bad you can't do anything. Okay, distance spell, meta magic, upcast sleep. Damn! Shh, quiet, quiet, go to sleep. He yelled at me and stormed out again. That was the last I saw of him in person. I didn't get a chance to roll for anything. And I wasn't even planning on killing his character. It just would have been a jailbreak plot for next set. What, jailbreaking him out of his lava grave? <laughs> Cut to another year later, I open the university newspaper and see his picture. He's head of a university student conservative club and got a prestigious job as an aide in a congressman's office. I've not seen nor heard from him, but who knows? Maybe I play D&D with a future senator. Ah, plenty of jokes I feel like I can make about that, but for the sake my sandy i won't <laughs> look i've got no problem with power gaming in a game that it fits and you know what in this level 21 shot a gauntlet of monsters this is the exact place that power gaming would be an amazing fit but you need to know how the game works in order to be a power gamer and you would be shocked by how many times i see this in just my DD life so many people want to be that guy the most powerful character the dude that blows everybody's mind with their insane build but then the chips go down and they don't really know what they're doing, which is kind of crazy to me because if anything, copying a build for Dungeons and Dragons should be fairly easy, all things considered. Like I remember back in World of Warcraft Legion, I had to beg the RNG gods for certain legendary drops in order to optimize my unholy death knight. But, but in D&D, just gotta grab the right multi-class, pick the right spells and have the right spread. Shouldn't be that complicated, at least for most people. After seeing how supportive the community was with my friend's story that I posted recently, I feel like I finally built the confidence to tell my own. I recently joined a one-shot campaign in the DM's homebrew world. I won't say the name because it'll easily identify me. Let's just say it consisted of lesser dragons, controlled by a larger dragon, terrorizing simple farming folk. Okay, so your DM's the writer for Godzilla King of the Monsters. Alright, write that down, write that down. Over the course of the campaign, things went well. We fought some raiders, rescued some damsels, swindled merchants out of expensive items, all the best parts of Dungeons & Dragons. The majority of our party consisted of at least two married couples and myself. I am married, but my wife isn't into the hobby. While I don't judge anyone for having relationships or role-playing them in a game, out of respect for my wife, I don't partake. 
It's not something she forces on me, it's just how I am. This has caused trouble for me and a lot of hurt feelings from other people in past campaigns. So I've started taking to playing characters like lizard folk so I can always use the same excuse. He's a totally different species from you. He understands the concept of friendship, but there's no way he'd see you romantically. It's nothing personal. His people mate for utility, not love or lust. Anyway, sorry for rambling, but I promise it's all relevant. We discover that raiding parties have been forming to gain goods to offer the dragons in an attempt to ward them off. Unfortunately, these parties don't care for the livelihoods of the poor, and have taken to ransacking local farms, effectively starving the owners. The party follow up on this information and come across a grouping of farms, roughly five in total, sharing a massive plot of land. Unfortunately, we learned that we were unable to stop the raid. However, luckily my character happened to be a druid. I requested that the farmers give us shelter and shared whatever supplies they currently had left. And in return, I would spend all the time it required to regrow their farms using the plant growth spell, basically making the crops twice as good for an entire year. They agreed and it was done. Of course, my party being my party chose to celebrate in their rooms. My character just decided to hang out in the field. I took one last look at his work before going to bed. My dungeon master then informs me that a <laughs> If I say that sentence out loud, I feel like I'll go to jail. Hmm, generously chest- that's terrible. Ooh, well-endowed red-haired farm girl, roughly 18 years in age, wearing nothing but a white nightdress gently wakes me from slumber and invites me to her room. Of course, my character is shocked to see this and asks her why she came out here looking like that, knowing full well there's like raiders in the area. She informs my character that she is my reward and that although she's- are you sure you don't have a problem with our age difference? Yeah, I wish you were even younger. Alright. I'm trying not to break the Dungeon Master's game. So I give her my character's go-to excuse, as explained above. Then I explain that I have my character put his robe over her to just cover her up, and walk her back to her room to make sure she makes it there safely. But, of course, the Dungeon Master could not take no for an answer. She then proceeded to describe the girl swaying her body like a professional dancer as she's slowly undressed. Then the DM tried to roleplay her, pulling me into her bed. At this point, I just shut it down. I simply told the DM no. And of course, they wanted an explanation. Once again, I explain the lizard man thing. The fact that it was weird she had to point out the girl was 18 and generously endowed with red hair. My wife is a redhead, by the way. Diem knew this. She tried to argue that the rest of the party was having fun, so I should indulge. At this point, I just excused myself, apologized to the rest of the party, and ended the audio call. I later got a private message from the dungeon master accusing me of overreacting and derailing the one-shot. The rest of the party later informed me that the DM muted them, and would ping them after a quick solo session with me. There is no judgment to those who want to roleplay intimate moments, but my wife has been hurt in the past, and while I understand many probably don't see D&D roleplay as cheating, I love her dearly and just can't bring myself to do that. The DM violated my one and only boundary and chastised me for sticking to it, and for that, I had to go. Still, I wonder if I over- NO WAY, ARE YOU CRAZY?! Like, if you stayed, I would've been playing that one Annie Edison bit. You know, who hurt you, why didn't it stick? Staying would just be hurting yourself, and look, I don't know about cheating on your wife and D&D &D romance. I honestly don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, the crit roll cast are always romancing other people's characters and it's never a big deal. But hey, that's a boundary that you have. And even though I don't personally get it, you have it and I'm gonna respect that, especially since it's romance. You can't force it. And if you don't want it, that's perfectly legitimate no matter what reason you have. Not only is this DM forcing romance, but also, the description of the love interest is absolutely just gross. Oh my god. Roleplaying intimacy is already hard to pull off without making it weird, but this DM just went screw it and just did her best to make it as weird as humanly possible. So yeah, my FBI agent listening in on this is probably already calling in the SWAT team thanks to this DM, so yeah. Thanks for that, man. Alright, and that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Shadow Over Kerkonos D&D podcast. The full adventure is linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment FBI open up to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can submit them directly to us. There's an email in the description. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories in essence.com subscribe i will see you all next time farewell
I stopped filming Scare's filming because the, the stand fell and I just started watching this Lumity animatic, but oh my god, this is so cute! I've watched it like five. Oh, that actually hurt. Oh!